Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Matt for The Remnant Underground, coming to you once again from the dark and musty catacombs where the old Catholic faith survives despite the best efforts of the Christophobes worldwide to crush it. So the 2017 centenary of Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima really is living up to the apocalyptic expectations when you think about it. The floods, the earthquakes, hurricanes, weird solar and lunar shows all over the place, violence in the streets, you know, you even see the violence now on the football field, Rob. What about that? What's going on with the NFL these days? Have to pay attention. They can't kneel forever. They can't stand for the national anthem, right. so they kneel and all of this. I guess they're not getting paid enough. Is that what it is? Anyway, it all sort of figures into this apocalyptic moment in history that we're living through, which is only sort of punctuated by the pontificate of Pope Francis, who's pretty much obliterating what's left of the human element of Christ's church in the modern world. It's really, really something. I mean, they're, they're moving so fast now, it's almost impossible to keep up with what's happening in the Vatican and all throughout the church. But I guess, in fairness, you know, blaming Pope Francis for all of this is a bit short-sighted. I mean, the man is not exactly Julius Felsenberg. You know, he's not a cosmopolitan deceiver who's got everyone in the palm of his hands. He's just sort of a wrecking ball. And I hate to say that, uh, or I hate to get, con convey the impression that we believe that Pope Francis, of all people, is responsible for the auto-demolition of the church that's now in full swing. You know, after a hundred years of modernist infiltration of the Catholic Church, including, well, their great coming out party at the Second Vatican Council, uh, a Pope Francis was inevitable, right? I mean, as our, ch our church suffers through this most devastating revolution in her history, uh, it was a matter of time before something like Pope Francis happened, and that certainly has now happened. But who knows? I mean, who knows what this man is going to do next? He's, he's now mulling over, Rob. Have you heard this? No. Pope Francis is mulling over the possibility of actually getting rid of the College of Cardinals. <laughs> you know why? Mm. So he can choose his, his own successor. Oh, oh, I like it. That's what he's working on now. Wow. It's, just, it's just unbelievable, just tearing everything down. Well, you heard that here first. If you want to follow more on that, check out RemnantNewspaper.com because we're going to be following that story closely. Pope Francis' next bizarre aspiration. Now, he's already announced his intention to reduce the number of priests working in the Vatican. And this, of course, is in order to uh, load up on lay people, especially the ladies, to work inside the Vatican. And now, as I say, now he's going to try to find a way to choose his own successor. And, and this, is, this is after he, you know continues the auto demolition of the liturgy by turning the liturgy over to the bishops conferences worldwide and we know what those cats do with liturgy so which basically means there's not going to be much oversight on the liturgy we're just going to have the likes of cardinal slupich telling everybody in his archdiocese what the mass is going to look like and that should be fun what's going to happen to the traditional latin mass under pope francis is anyone's guess but we're all kind of holding our breath wondering to see what's going to happen there so, I don't know. I mean, when it comes to the liturgy, Pope Francis really isn't, I guess he's really not much of a liturgy guy. Um, I mean, we've all, we're all familiar with the idea that, or with the fact that Pope Francis, for whatever reason, uh, does not genuflect at the consecration of the Mass. Never. I can't find any video. Matter of fact, if any of our viewers can find video of Pope Francis genuflecting at the consecration at one of his Masses, would you please send it to the remnant because we will be happy to... Uh, to showcase that, to show people that yeah, every now and then he does, but most of the time he doesn't. Another thing that's sort of interesting, Rob, he never sings. Hmm. You notice this? No. I've combed the internet. I can't find any example of Pope Francis singing at Mass, intoning in Our Father or anything else. Maybe he's bad voice. Maybe he's bad voice, totally tone deaf. I don't know, but kind of an odd thing. You know, I don't think we've ever had a Pope, at least in recent times, or I can, can't remember, that didn't sing at all. I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I, I don't need to... Uh, break this down for you. Um, piece by piece, motu proprio by motu proprio, I think he's up to 16 motu proprios now, Pope Francis is. Um, the mighty Catholic Church that we all love uh, is being dismantled right before our eyes. And really, at the end of the day, it's not just Pope Francis, it's a continuum, a modernist continuum. These modernist thugs who came into our church, who invaded our church, Pope St. Pius X did everything he could to stop them a hundred years ago, but they embedded like ticks, and they are now out, and they are proud. And these are the same cats that gave us the new mass, you know, the new catechism, a new springtime, a new evangelization, a new rosary, a new code of canon law, everything, new, new, new. 
completely transforming the church and making it in their own sort of human image and likeness. This is just the way it is. And if you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm accurate, you think I'm being hyperbolic, I'm sorry, but you haven't done your research. They've changed everything. And now, of course, we have this burgeoning new moral code that the Catholic Church is getting behind, whereby things like unthinkable things, such as, you know, allowing unrepentant public adulterers to receive the sacraments, uh, are now becoming a reality. And in place of the four last things, or concern for the four last things, we hear much more about climate change and about the need for, you know, throwing out our air conditioners and, and going green. I mean, th this isn't, this isn't, we're not making this up. It's in the news every, every day. A complete, irreversible revolution, transformation of the Catholic Church is, is going on right in front of our eyes. Now, you, know, you think, well, you know, <laughs> it can't get much worse. Oh, yeah, it can. Because get ready for the approval of gay unions, by the way, because that's next. So you think, you know, Father James Martin is some sort of lone wolf renegade? No, he's not. Please, please, people, stop blaming little Father Martin or this bishop or that bishop for essentially catching the drift of the man in charge. I am so tired of watching these experts on the internet, Rob, tell us about, you know, that this bishop is terrible, he's doing this and that. And when you do a little research, you realize this bishop, this terrible bishop, is doing exactly what Francis wants him to do, but the same commentator won't say a word about Francis. You know what this is? This is, in my opinion, it's a violation of Christian charity. You don't blame the underlings, the hirelings, for doing what they're told, what their boss wants them to do. So if you don't have the guts to say where all this is coming from and to admit it, or where it's coming from, then maybe you should take a break for a while, because you're just part of the problem, not the solution. But in any case, this gay union things are coming up. We can't blame Father Martin or Cardinal Supich for this. You remember when the Catholic Church used to teach that homosexual acts are mortal sins that cry to heaven for vengeance? When's the last time you heard that? Well, no more. We're not going to hear that ever again from these men. Now we have a pope. And maybe, we, Rob, we can put this, throw this, this clip up again. We've done it before down here, but it's so revealing. We have a Holy Father who is hugging two men, a married couple, old friends of his, hugging them in a very prominent fashion with cameras running. Now remember, as you watch this, the Holy Father, cameras running, hugging a married gay couple. Take a look. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Is that is that what Jesus would do, Rob? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. No scandal there, though, certainly. No, 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 no. Because he's reaching out to them. He's, he's going where they are, meeting them where they are. Because he's going to bring them back. That's what, that's, obviously, that's what's going right, to happen there. Right. But that's not the end of it. That's a while ago. This is when the Pope was visiting the States. Things are, are, are happening rapidly, as I say. And now he's actually opening the door for gay unions. In this new book, Politics and Society, which is actually a series of 12 conversations between Bergoglio and Dominique Walton, who's a French sociologist. Well, in that book, we read the following from Pope Francis. Quote, let's not play with the truth, but let's say things as they are. Marriage is between a man and a woman. This is the precise term. Let's call unions between same-sex people civil unions, not marriage. End quote. You see what happened there, huh, Rob? That's very Jesuitical. See, in what sounds like a beautiful defense of marriage, you're saying between one man and one woman, that is marriage. S gay unions, that's something else. So you see what he's doing there? This is the Pope opening the door. Oh, marriage between one man and one woman is very, very, very important. I insist on that, absolutely. But, Your Holiness, gay unions, are those, is, is that okay? Are those sinful still? Gay people that are acting in this lifestyle and acting this lifestyle out? Is that a sin? Is that wrong? And what does His Holiness say? Who am I to judge? Eh? And so that's, that's the message coming from the Vatican. There's just no stopping this man. So, yes, you love the Pope, Mr. Neo-Catholic. That's exciting. It's also completely irrelevant. I'm glad you love the Pope. I love the Pope. We have to love all men on earth, right? As, as temples of the Holy Ghost, brothers in Christ and so forth. But when you start f looking at what's happening now and your only response is, yeah, but I love the Pope. This is kindergarten. It's childish and it's irrelevant that you love the Pope. Okay, well, fine. But what is he saying? What is he doing? Do you approve of that or not? 
So it's no surprise to us that this week it was announced all over the world through uh, you know, mainstream media that 60 prominent Catholic theologians, priests, and academics, including, by the way, Rendon colonist Chris Ferrara and Dr. John Rao, have issued a letter formally accusing Pope Francis of spreading heresy in the wake of Amoris Laetitiae. So we've come to this point now. This letter was spearheaded by our friend and ally in London, Dr. Joseph Shaw, and it's basically a 25-page le letter which was delivered directly to Pope Francis in a very honorable way. This is what we mean when we say we resist you to the face. It comes from Galatians. It comes from St. Paul. Honorably resisting Peter to his face rather than behind his back. But in a very honorable way, this letter was presented to Pope Francis at Santa Marta, his residence, over a month ago. And, of course, true to form, Pope Francis couldn't be bothered to answer it. And so then the letter was given to the Associated Press. And this week it blew up. It went viral all over the world. So, here's we, there's, this is where we are. The whole world now knows that a group of top-notch, top-notch theologians, priests, academics from Rome to Oxford to Menzingen to New York and beyond have put their careers on the line now by issuing a filial correction, as they call it, of the Pope for propagating seven heretical positions concerning marriage, morality, and the sacraments. I mean, it's good that someone has finally done this, but this is a dark, dark day for the church. But I say to these men, well played, gentlemen, strength and honor to you, and you're going to suffer for it, obviously. By the way, one of the signatory uh, the signers of this, of this letter is none other than Bishop Bernard Follet, the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X. And in a way, this might be the biggest aspect of this as far as a news story is concerned, because, you know, we have to believe that after that, after Bishop Fillet signed this, this letter, this filial correction of the Holy Father, that that puts the kibosh on any sort of SSPX Vatican agreement under Pope Francis, which, of course, we have not been in favor of all along here at the Remnant. Bishop Fillet is publicly resisting Pope Francis to his face. Thanks be to God. And up next, well, that's what everybody's asking. What's going to happen next? This is far from over. Cardinal Burke, of course, in his formal correction, which I believe, with all my heart and I have reason to believe, is forthcoming very soon, that formal correction. Let's not be, if we could just go on the side for a moment, let's, let's not be myopic about Cardinal Burke's role in all of this. I mean, let's think about this for a minute. He, he is, without a doubt, the most powerful opposition to the errors of the, of the Francis pontificate in the world today. Now, his plan is working pretty well if you have the patience to see how it's playing out. Now, I know we all want more. We all want that formal correction tomorrow all over the front page of the New York Times. But think about this for a second. What happens if he does that? What happens if, if Cardinal Burke comes out tomorrow without setting things up properly, comes out and he says, I accuse the Pope of heresy, blah, 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 and we're all going to be so happy and it's going to feel so great. But then what happens? Cardinal Burke who right now is the, the most authoritative figure in the church, who's opposing Amoris Laetitiae, his voice then, after he does it, if he, unless he does it right, unless he does it correctly, properly nuanced, properly set up, if he doesn't do it correctly, he be, his voice becomes another, just another of, among many in this echo chamber, nicely marginalized all of a sudden for challenging the most humble pope in history. You see the problem? He's a cardinal. He's not one of us. He's not a blogger. He's a cardinal. And there are ways, proper ways of going about this, and we as lay people need to be patient. I mean, given his position, Cardinal Burke is opposing Pope Francis in a way that I believe history will celebrate and laud. After all, who doesn't know at this point in time, who doesn't know exactly where Cardinal Raymond Burke stands on Amoris Laetitia and Pope Francis? His quote-unquote silence, Cardinal Burke's silence, when it comes to the formal correction that we're all awaiting, that's kind of like St. Thomas More's silence on the question of King Henry VIII's marriage back in 16th century England. That silence is booming across the whole world right now with everyone, including the Vatican, watching Cardinal Burke, waiting to see what he's going to do. This formal correction of his, of the errors of Pope Francis, is imminent, I believe it, but I think we have to wait and be patient and let him do it in his own time, and then at the same time appreciate what he's building for us at lower levels in the church. He's providing the ecclesial firepower or authority that we all need to stand and resist, you know, as these, these academics and theologians now have done with their filial correction of Pope Francis. He gives them 
sort of inadvertently the authority to proceed and gives that to all of us. So this thing again, this thing is far from over. All, everything is heating up right now and it seems to us that we need to prepare for something very, very serious that's going to happen and possibly something, something terrifying. Something's going to shake us a little bit because Francis is, is obviously at a fever pitch right now to change everything and to make it so it can never be changed back. So what are we going to see? What is, what is the church going to look like in the next few years? Where are we going to stand for defense? Where are we going to find defense for teaching our children the old traditional moral theology on marriage, for example? It's all becoming, it's falling apart. And the reality is that there is no precedent for what's happening to the Catholic Church right now. There is no precedent. Not even the Aryan crisis now rises to this level. The situation is beyond any sort of crisis the Church has ever suffered or has ever endured. Are we looking at an anti-pope? I don't know. And I don't think you know. We don't know what this is. And I don't know how important it is to put the label on. Again, let's not allow the need to label everything and to have some sort of closure on this. Let's not allow that to polarize us. No matter what we call Pope Francis, or no, what, no matter where we, we think he sits or how he can be defined, the reality is, is that the bride of Christ is under assault from within and from without, and that the man who's wearing white in Rome right now is the problem, not the solution. This is something we can all agree on. Does that sound shocking? Yes, it should, it should sound shocking. This is shocking. And the reality is nobody knows just how to respond right now, exactly, how the best way is to proceed. Now that our Father in Rome has sided with the enemies of Christ's church. Do you think I like saying that? you think I get a kick out of saying that? That's a horrific thing to say, but I don't know how else to say it. As, as Francis now hobnobs with the population controllers and the climate change Nazis and the Hollywood celebs and everything else, Think about what, what, what this means for us, the way the church is going right now. God help us. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, this is betrayal at the highest levels of the church. And it should leave us all not feeling vindicated or smart or, or you know, like we're so brave to say it like it is. That's not how it should leave. It should leave the Catholic heart devastated. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of a scene. Of, of, and Rob's going to hate me for this, but I'm reminded of a scene from the old movie Braveheart. You remember that movie, Rob? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's when William Wallace recognizes the full extent of his betrayal at the hands of his friend, and not only his friend, but the only authority in that at that point who was capable of standing up to the evil of his day. You can cue that up for us, Rob. It's just a couple minutes. If I must. All right, thanks. Let's take a look. Okay, did you see that? Did you see that look on his face? That, that's exactly the look that should be on all of our faces right now as we look at what's happening to our church and who is doing it to our church. That's how the faithful Catholic should look right now when looking across the Tiber to the eternal city and see what's happening to the church that we all love. It's devastating beyond words, which is why the traditional Catholic counter-revolution, friends, needs to begin on its knees, if you know what I mean, at this most awful realization that the shepherd has left us to the mercy of the wolves. We all need to stand up and defend the faith, absolutely, but not without tears in our eyes, not without terror in our hearts for what it means when we see evil progress as it has. And in conclusion tonight, Let's recall the other big centenary that we're celebrating this year. It's more or less been eclipsed, probably rightfully so, by the Fatima centenary, but it's a very important anniversary. 100 years ago, I think next month, the militia of the Immaculata was founded by St. Maximilian Kolbe in Rome. 
Skupaj s šestimi brati minoriti smo ustanovili vojsko brez madežne. Cilj gibanja bo preprost. Po brez madežni Mariji pridobiti v svet in vse duše za Kristusa. To bo gibanje, ki na ljudi navdušuje za svetost vsak danjem življenju, da bi postali orodje v rokah brez madežne, bojevniki v njeni vojski. He was sort of like the modern day patron, he and Pius X, patrons of the traditional Catholic movement. This Polish priest encouraged two things, total resistance, total resistance to the evil at hand and the consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary of all of the soldiers in his militia. His militia of the Immaculata began with a personal act of consecration to Our Lady and the wearing of the miraculous medal as a sign of that consecration. And this was for, as Father as Saint Maximilian Kolbe put it, this was for quote the conversion of sinners, heretics, schismatics, and above all the Masons, and for the sanctification of all persons under the sponsorship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Mediatrix. End quote. Now that part about Freemasons is very interesting. No single organization was criticized and condemned more often and by more popes than Freemasonry. And if you look at what's happened to the church, you look about the fact that the architect of the new mass, Annabel Bugnini, was sent off to Iran by Pope Paul VI under suspicion of Freemasonry. You can see the signs of Freemasonry's triumph and success in the church. And Father Maximilian Kolbe, who no, no, no Neo-Catholic out there is gonna call him a rad trad, I hope, who should be dismissed, right? And yet his Immaculata, his militia was set up because of the threat of Freemasonry. And he used his little printing presses and he worked day and night to, fo to, to oppose those forces of evil in the church. So Father Colby reminds us that our greatest advocate in this war against demons and Freemasons is she who crushed the head of the serpent. Beautiful faith. She crushed the head of the serpent. She is the terror of demons, the tower of David, the queen of the most holy rosary, the refuge of sinners. So no matter how bad things get, and admittedly they're really, really bad right now, no matter how dark it is, this night is, or the next one, or no matter how fearful our children and our families and our communities are, or how discouraging it is, we have the most powerful protector in the history of the world. And we must not, we cannot lose sight of that or lose faith in that. Yes, things are really, really bad right now, but in the end, the Immaculate Heart will triumph, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And if we stay with her, so will we. And as it says on that miraculous medal that Father Colby insisted, his militia wore around their necks, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Pray for Pope Francis. I'm Michael Matt from Remnant Underground, and we'll see you next week.